Good evening and welcome to the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. I'm Barry Smith, the director of the Institute of Philosophy, and I will be chairing tonight's Open for Discussion panel. Now, these are an uh, annual series of panel discussions which try to bring people from different perspectives to consider some of the critical issues that we need to face and that we probably need to discuss together. Tonight's seminar uh, is not that. Tonight's panel discussion is going to be on the topic that's been the focus of all our lives for most of the, the last year of 2020, and that's COVID-19 and how we deal with it. Tonight's panel session is asking whether, as humanities scholars, we must remain on the outside looking in, or whether we should have a sage for the humanities or should have humanities scholars on sage. Now, during the COVID pandemic, the government has been closely advised by the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, including experts across all sorts of scientific and medical disciplines, but it hasn't taken the step that has happened in Germany of including humanities scholars in the range of experts consulted. Should it do so here? And do we need uh, some other perspectives to bring and inform the decisions that are going to affect all of our lives? Can we learn how to live with the virus or can we trace a route out of it and to building the new way the future will be for all of us by drawing on the work of anthropologists, historians, philosophers, political theorists, lawyers, literary scholars, and those from the creative and cultural sector? Should we be asking them for their decisions and judgments about how our future should be? Well, with me to help as answer these questions are Lindsay Stonebridge. Lindsay is Interdisciplinary Professor of Humanities and Human Rights at the University of Birmingham and the author of Placeless People, Writing, Rights and Refugees, The Judicial Imagination, Writing After Nuremberg, and a recent collection of essays, Writing and Writing, not something you can make sense of in speech, but one is with a W, one is with an R, Literature in the Age of Human Rights, and that was published last month by Oxford University Press. She's also currently hard at work producing a critical and creative uh, book about Hannah Arendt, and that's due to come out in 2022. Joe Wolf is the Alfred Landeker Professor of Values and Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. He's also currently the co-chair of the Ethics and Governance Working Group for the World Health Organization, looking at ethical issues across the global response to COVID. His books include works on disadvantage, ethics and public policy, and an introduction to moral philosophy. And many of you will know him as a regular contributor to uh, The Guardian, where he has a column on higher education. Supadra Das is a museum curator at UCL. She is a writer and a historian specializing in the history and legacy of eugenics and scientific racism. And I would encourage you to look at her uh, TEDx talk on those topics. We hope to be joined uh, when technical issues subside by Philippe Sands and I will introduce him when he arrives, uh, technology permitting. Also, is he there? Have we got yeah. Philippe with us? Great. Oh, Philippe, welcome. Good to have you here. So Philippe Sands QC is a professor of law <laughs> at University College London. He's a practicing barrister at Matrix Chambers and a prize winning author. As a lawyer, he appears as a counsel before international courts and tribunals and sits as an international arbiter. He has written several academic books on international law, but is known to many of you as the author of East-West Street, The Origins of Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide, and most recently, The Rat Line, Love, Lies and Justice on the Trail of a Nazi Fugitive, which as many of you know, was made into a very successful BBC podcast. Sadly, Professor Jeremy Farrar can't be with us this evening and he sends his apologies and he was delighted that instead we will be joined by, and is very grateful to, Anthony Costello. So Anthony is the former director 
of the Institute for Global Health at the University of London and was, until March uh, 2018, Director of Maternal, Child and Adolescent Health at the World Health Organization. He's a professor of global health and the author of The Social Edge, The Power of Sympathy Groups for Our Health, Wealth and Sustainable Future, but many of you will know him as a member of Independent Sage. We will have a surprise appearance by Carl Friston, who is a professor of neuroscience at University College London, part of the Wellcome Centre for Neuroimaging, and uh, also a contributor to Independent Sage. And where we have uh, opportunity, we'll, we'll bring Carl in along with Anthony to tell us about some of the issues of modeling and the issues of decision-making on Independent Sage. So welcome, all of you, glad to have you with us. I thought I'd start by asking each of you uh, the same question. And that is, in the course of this pandemic and everything that we've learned from it, what, what has most surprised you? What, what facts have come to light or what finding has most surprised you? And I want to start with you, if I may, Anthony. Oh, difficult. Um, I guess what most surprised me was the uh, press conference on March the 12th, the very first one, uh, because in a sense, we'd had secret February. So if you go back, I mean, the first case of COVID was December the 7th in China. China more or less suppressed everything up until they confessed it to WHO on December the 31st. They then kept things quiet at home domestically right up till January the 20th. Uh, and then of course it all exploded. And then China moved into a uh, very progressive mode and uh, and really began to get things under control but it was clearly by the end of January I think everyone knew this was the big one this was not flu it was transmitting at almost three times the, the the rate of flu which has a huge effect on exponential spread um, it had a fatality rate that was probably going to be around five to ten times that of the average seasonal flu and but in February we didn't really know what was going on because we didn't know what the sage was we didn't know who was on it we didn't get any feedback or anything and then in March things began to happen you know Italy Iran had spread out from everywhere and then you get this almost incredible press conference where people stand up and you know, respected medics and scientists and say the spread of this virus is inevitable, which it wasn't because by then China and South Korea controlled it, that suppression and testing were basically a waste of time. They, they backtracked on that, but uh, they stopped it in the community. They claimed that herd immunity would solve the problem with 60% of us all getting it. And then they backtracked on that. They said the behavior restrictions would be poorly tolerated, which actually they weren't. I mean, the, the British public have done an amazing job. I mean, it's beginning well, to... Yeah. Well, I and, feel anyway, and, and people would self-isolate, which they didn't. So all of these reasons, yeah. I found that really shocking and has kind of led to Indie Sage. So I, I, I uh, suspect we'll get into many of those issues and I want to come back to you and pick them up. But, but clearly there's a surprise that SAGE were not delivering what you might have expected from them, hence independent SAGE. Same question to, to Lindsay, what, what most surprised you? Well, I was pretty surprised to be in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. That was quite a surprise. And I think as a humanities scholar, I found myself to be very surprised to be in so much science all of a sudden, as if my life depended on it, which it indeed did and does. But I think the thing that stayed with me, Barry, was the um, couple of weeks into lockdown, the first couple of weeks of lockdown, when we had that still calm of something like a quiet consensus, like that kind of really fresh spring air. And it stayed with me because of its clarity. And it seemed that that moment, just, it was a very short moment, 
um, it seemed as if we all agreed roughly that we were sharing something like the same reality. And then the period Anthony has described and the period after that, I think what's been really damaging and very terrifying is the fact that we don't seem to be sharing the same reality. And the way that our, we, our grasp of reality, and a shared sense of evidence, a shared sense of common sense um, has led to some very bad decision making. And I think it's been morally and psychologically catastrophic as well. So what really stays with when, I, when I'm an older, even older woman, um, what will stay with me are those moments where we seem to be on the same page. And that was, I think, because we'd locked down and there was a sense that we were coming to terms with the reality. And then that went again. Barry, you're muted. A very strange sense in which we were participating in a great collective action and, and it required us to do nothing but to ensure that we did nothing together and that other people did nothing and, and that was the sense we were all in it together. I agree. Philippe, what's, what has surprised you in this strange time? Oh, well, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. One of the things that surprised me is how amazingly adaptable human beings are. I mean, who would have thought that nine months on, certainly, I mean, I can't speak for the whole country because I don't know the whole country, but people, you know, in our circles and communities, including our children's circles, and the younger generation who are spread around the country and even around the world, how incredibly compliant human beings are. Um, if you had said to anyone a year ago that we would be living in these conditions, people would have said, no way, it's just not possible that human beings could give up so much in this way. And yet it, it has happened extraordinarily. And of course, there are many examples of it not working perhaps as it should. But if you go across the globe, and I've traveled a little bit, it is astonishing how compliant people tend to be, how adaptable we are in terms of what our expectations are. And actually, I find that quite frightening because I think it sort of opens the door. I mean, both Lindsay and I work uh, in part on another era um, back in the 30s and the 40s. And you can see that actually it wouldn't take a whole lot to make most people move back into that mindset. But I think in relation to the essential adaptability and compliance of many human beings is just the catastrophic incompetence of government. I mean, it, it just makes me weep. Again, going back to the 30s and the 40s, if you look at how the war was prosecuted out of Whitehall, the planning, the meticulous attention to detail, envisaging all sorts of scenarios uh, in terms of planning for the post-war settlement, creating new international organizations, setting up an international military tribunal at Nuremberg, the attention to detail and planning is unbelievable. And in a sense, what you see is the real collapse of a country, a country that has totally lost its way, that has become serially incompetent at the government level, but not perhaps, I think, at the level of other parts of society. So it's a, it's a contradiction. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, the, th those are, I think, thoughts and sentiments that will be echoed by, by a lot of people listening. Uh, Philippe, when we come to you, I wonder if you could lean into the microphone a little. I think people were struggling to hear you. I'm looking at the chat and getting that at the same time. Thank you. Um, Supadra, your surprising revelation. First of all, that I haven't come out from a heart attack with all the stress about my internet connection going. If I disappear again, don't take it personally. Um, I think the solidarity surprised me as well. And I kind of agree with Philippe, yes and no, in as much as the thing that surprised me was how quickly we adapted to things that had been called for for such a long time, but had been ignored as a so-called minority need. So um, disabled students at UCL where I work have been advocating for years for teaching to go digital, for there to be these aspects of online teaching, to for things to be made accessible digitally. And it was, and credit to my colleagues who are lecturers and teachers at the university who over the course of the last 
nine months have been working themselves into the ground to try to do this properly. But I'm still amazed as to how quickly we managed it. Mm. So hopefully, if good things are going to come out of this situation, um, that would be one of them, which is that we maintain this level of accessibility of our discourse mm. and of the things that are going on that deserve to have a wider platform. Yeah, I think I think it's true that a lot of people have said, even though they, they feel the strain of sitting in front of Zoom, they, they know they're including more people. And I think we are probably tonight than we might have been. Joe, same thought. What surprised you? Well, I, I've been surprised by many of the things that other people have said. But uh, as soon as you asked that question, a particular episode came to mind, which was very early on. I don't remember when exactly, maybe February. I was invited to a seminar and there were a number of mathematical modelers there who were talking about their models of the uh, pandemic. And I remember one of them very patronizingly saying, you know, we're, we're so well off in England. We've got the best modelers in the world. Poor old Germany. There's only one guy who's part time and he's really a physicist. Um, and so Germany are really going to struggle, but we're going to be we're going to be great. You know, we, we've got this sorted out. And you know, we'd had a lot of success with modeling before. So I went away from that thinking, yeah, okay, these are very bright people. They've got their models, we'll, we'll be fine. And then there, you know, people like Anthony came on TV and were you know, calling for a much stricter lockdown, much more, um, much more action. And my friends were saying, have you heard of this man Costello? He's saying we should do all this other stuff. I said, oh, Costello, yeah. Who's Costello? And they said, no, 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 he used to run the WHO. And I said, no, 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 he didn't run the WHO. He was in charge of child health and maternal health. He's a child health man. What does he know? But there are these modelers who are doing this fantastic work and they've got it all sorted out. And of course, I was completely wrong. And Anthony was right. And I, so I, you didn't know I badmouthed you, Anthony, but I did early on. And my friends were right and you were right. And the modelers were an embarrassment because they had this... Um, some of them anyway had, were just very overconfident in their ability to model. Uh, they didn't make their model public, other people didn't use it, they didn't allow it to be discussed in a scientific way. And I think we went wrong for a few weeks at the beginning, maybe longer than a few weeks. So it surprised me that people who had such scientific confidence in what they were doing could be so wrong about it. I, I think that's interesting because I think the public had not come to the idea until quite recently that science is contested, there are many different opinions, that evidence is weighed by different groups and so forth. I mean, if, if, if one surprise has come out for the general public, it's that it, there's no such thing as science says. I think that's, that's definitely there. But I can't resist bringing in Carl Friston, who is one of the leading uh, both modelers and critics of other models in the in the current situation and and Carl modeling um, a difficult thing we, we have to remember as a philosopher I'm always told by my colleague James Nguyen models contain propositions that are literally false about the phenomena but somehow they generate truths and I wonder whether you think it was about better thinking about models rather than just rushing to models. What, what, what's your thought about Joe's remark on modelers getting it wrong? So I should just say I'm here as Anthony's little helper and his modeler, um, but I concur exactly with, with Joe's assessment. Um, I just wanted to say the most surprising thing for me about this pandemic is how quickly time goes. It doesn't seem a few weeks ago since I was, you know, taking down the Christmas tree and here we are a year later and um, that, that's strange to me and surprising but the, the but the, in terms of you know what we're talking about I think yeah you're absolutely right what I was surprised to find out was the um the lack of sophistication in the uh, modelers and more, more than that um a surprise that there was such a narrow view of the kind of people that could be advising on the right ways forward. Um, so you talk about SAGE and the, you look at the, um, the substantive input to SAGE and it's extremely narrow. It's SPIM and SPIB. So um, it's great we have behavioural, the B side there, that was a good thing. But just to have these two 
bilateral, very siloed perspectives. I thought that was surprising. And even more surprising when you actually look at the, the breadth and the um, diversity of expertise in the modeling group, that, that, that to my mind was, was, was very wanting. Um, no expertise in quantifying uncertainty. And as you say, all models are wrong. Models are just hypotheses. So that's how you go into it. I've got this hypothesis, I've got that hypothesis, what's the evidence for it? Um, and what surprised me that there was no mechanism and there is no mechanism now in the experts advising SAGE to evaluate the evidence for their hypotheses. So this notion that they are overconfident, I think spot on, uh, but it's not because they're arrogant, it's because they have no way of measuring the evidence for their hypotheses. Thank you. I mean, I, I'm interested and want to come back to you, Anthony, to, to, to think about those questions. Uh, who gets to decide which experts we need and, and who we should have? And I'm, I'm wondering whether when you, you and your colleagues, Carl and, and others, set up Independent Sage, whether there was thought given to uh, a very different constitution to the, the group of people who were advising on, on Sage. Yeah, well, the biggest shock to me was the absence of independent public health. I mean, it was after they finally released. I mean, the, the Guardian had leaked the names of people on Sage and then they released the names. And there are some, you know, good people, lots of good people there. But as, as Carl says, it's, it's behavioral scientists, modelers. And I, you know, I hate to say this since Jeremy Farrell was nice about me, but, um, you know, there were four medics there. And uh, the problem is that, you know, Sir Mark Warper had appointed Jeremy Farrer, Sir Jeremy Farrer to replace him at Welcome, had appointed Patrick Valance, had appointed Chris Whitty. And let's be brutally honest, they're all four from the same cloth. They're all clinical academics and good at what they do, but none of them had actual pandemic management or public health experience. Mm -hmm. So when you also looked at the SAGE, 23 people, 16 were men, mm -hmm. there was, n well, I thought there was no black or minority ethnic group member at all, but people tell me, of course, Jonathan Van Tam was there on the, uh, from Public Health England, which of course is not independent, it's government. And, and his uh, grandfather was a senior Vietnamese uh, official. But, you know, it was, uh, so it was quite skewed. And although we can criticize the modelers, I mean, early on in a pandemic, they don't know much about what's about the virus. They knew enough. I mean, I always say, look, at the end of January, we knew this was a big one. It was spreading incredibly rapidly. Um, it had a, unacceptably high fatality rate. We saw the pictures from Wuhan uh, and therefore that was enough to raise the risk level to incredibly high and get your pandemic plan moving. But then the next problem was who was in charge? And if you'd had, you know, when I was at WHO and we had a crisis team, you would go into the crisis room with panels all around with people from all over the world chipping in you'd have a managerial chair, you'd have a leading chair, you'd have clinicians, epidemiologists, communications people, logisticians, uh, primary care experts, mother and child health. You know, we'd all sit there and it would all be discussed and you would meet every day. And this was during the Zika virus thing. And then you would come back. And, and, and so it was very much a cross-disciplinary planning unit. The problem was we had Sage, who then had this very narrow view, not only of disciplines on it, but of what the role of science was. And most of them say, oh, well, we're just scientists. We just present the facts and let the politicians decide. Well, you know, you can't plan a pandemic with Matt Hancock. You know, he's a politician. He needs to be advised and you need to have a proper multidisciplinary team, which is why actually you do need lawyers and uh, historians and, and, and other people on it, but anthropologists particularly. Well, I'm glad you say that because I want to come to, to, to Lindsay too, although I, 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 I fear that um, when we move to a literary professor, 
uh, we have to just have a moment's silence for the, the introduction to Sage of extensive metaphors by Jonathan Van Tam. So <laughs> we had a <laughs> well, we, there. But, but Lindsay, um, what is missing for you? What is missing from the discussions in Sage? What, what, what range of discussions, what, what ideas, what uh, discourse is just not there that you think we, who all depend on them for the decisions and advice and thinking about uh, what happens next, what, what would you like to see there? Yeah, I mean, actually, listen, listening to Anthony just now, it's much worse than I thought. I mean, I thought these would be a few more social scientists in the room. Um, so I, I'm, I'm kind of taken aback by that. I think, Barry, we're also talking with the humanities rather than the social sciences about what kinds of thinking you need in an emergency situation or in an, in an unprecedented situation. And I've had in the back of my head, there's a quote by the literary critic Elaine Scarry, who wrote a wonderful book actually on torture for, for the UN. And Elaine Scarry once said, she said, in order to think, think freely at all, you need to be able to do two things. You need to be able to accurately identify what is the case. And you need to be able to imagine what is not the case. And then she says, and the common names for these, these two abilities are literature and history. Yeah. History is accurately saying what's there and literature is imagining a mental state of not there. So I think the first thing that e-humanities can bring is a different way of thinking that can help us understand what it, what it is to be so bewildered, what's so overwhelming and very difficult to see. And I think there's been this rush to name and analogize and give precedence that has stopped us from accurately seeing what is there, which goes back to my earlier point about having that anxiety about uh, no longer sharing a reality. And I think you're quite right. I think you know, uh, Joe's got this right too. That means kind of stepping back from models and information. And it certainly means stepping back from thinking that you can model or contrive a normality. There was a, uh, someone from Whitehall was quoted back in November and he was saying, it's fine, all we need to do now is to de design a new normality for a while. Well, I'm, I'm a 20th century cultural and literary historian, and I'm here to tell you that once politicians to start designing normalities, we are in, we're in real trouble we have, with this we have learned. So I think what the humanities can bring is an intense interest in the forms that information gives, which is a key question for literature, and the ways in which we understand the world, ways we which we comprehend the world. And I just want to give quick two, two examples. You take history first. I, um, Philip, I spent a lot of the time, my time in the 1930s and 1940s. And when you're training PhD students or postdocs, apprentice historians will always ask the question, is how on earth could they not see what was happening? It was happening right in front of them. What were they doing? Why couldn't they see it? Because um, they're all, you know, professor hindsight when they start. Um, and then you have to say, and this is where moral and political um, philosophy comes in together with history. You have to say, that is your question. How did they see and not see? What is it, for example, that made eugenics and mass euthanasia seem like okay ideas? How was it that some people became superfluous so quickly? What happened to moral responsibility? And these are our questions too. Those DNRs were signed. Decisions were made about who would get treatment and when. They were made in front of our noses. And the other, the other quote that's come back to me again and again, as, as you said, Barry, I've been writing this book on Hannah Arendt, and there's a passage in the beginning of Origins of Totalitarianism. And she's, she's trying to um, understand totalitarianism as a, she keeps on saying again and again, an unprecedented event, an unprecedented thing. And she really lived it. She was a Jewish refugee, so she had her nose like that up um, to this unprecedented event. And she says, you shouldn't try and deny the shock of what's happening by reaching for precedents or analogies. And then she says, comprehension means an attentive facing up to reality, an attentive facing up to reality, its complexity and its outrageousness. And I think that's what good historians do. That's what they bring. And it's also what writers and artists do. They give us the narrative and imaginative forms to comprehend what can seem completely overwhelming and help us grasp reality, not just as a set of models or set of what do we need to do now, or even as a set of policy, but grasp that kind of reality at a human historical 
an extrasensory level. So that's history. Literature comes in and it, it's been pointed out a lot. One of the things that's done really well out of the pandemic is the book trade. Book sales have rocketed during the pandemic. People have been reading their backsides off during that pandemic and not just because they're on their um, backsides either. Fiction, non-fiction, history, poetry, the lot. And it kept on being said that people were reading to escape the pandemic. And as a literary historian, I just think this was totally the wrong way round. I think people are reading, as they always do, incidentally, to negotiate their way into an extraordinary reality. It's not about escaping. It's about reality testing. It's about entering to another mental space to go back to that point that, you know, Elaine Scarry says you need to be able to do that, to think about what's not there. And it's also about dealing with the unknown, producing narratives that help us deal with contingency, but not deny contingency, not deny um, the reality that we find ourselves in. And I don't think we can overstress how important this kind of thinking is to our lives together, to, to the human condition. This is, a, this is a human virus, it attacks us. Um, this, this, this is why you know, we need a hage, a human advisory um, um, group for emergency. Mm -hmm. And again, I keep on thinking, just one last point, you know, writing, Susan Sontag once said, who was another person who liked to take the humanities right into the front line, she said, writing is a way of conferring and withdrawing meaning and sense upon a life. So it goes back to that question, how, how, how do we make some lives mean more than others? I don't think it's any, any accident at all that Black Lives Matter came with the question of what life was that came with the pandemic. Those two are joined at the hip. And how can we comprehend the reality where we're making those decisions without it actually driving us mad or driving us, and this is where I think we're now, into a massive stage of denial, where we're denying suffering, we're denying death, we're denying, very importantly, grief. So those are the things I think, you know, we, it's not just the information. I mean, I, I, in some ways I'd be appalled with humanities scholars saying, well, they did it this way in 1602, can we try that? And you think, no, no, not the leeches. Um, but I think it is a kind of, it's a, a mode of thinking that you, the humanities could, brings that actually takes us out of the drive to model, out of the desire, the, the desire which can be so dangerous to design a new reality or normality. Thank you. I mean, I, I hear two things in what you're saying. One of them, the ability to step back, uh, disengage from the sort of urgency of the immediate piling up of evidence or facts and, and to reflect. And the, and the other is, uh, instead of stepping back, it's a going forward. It's actually trying to experience and connect to the experiences people have of death, of loss, of grief, of the concern about their future and, and how we bring that into the picture. Now, I, I, you, you mentioned that's why you maybe we need Hadge or you know the, the 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 humanities sage, and I'm going to ask Joe about that in the moment. But I want to bring uh, Supadra in here because I, I think there's another question that lurks in this area, which is there's the, the stepping back and reflecting. There's the uh, experiencing what's going on. The other thing I think is how uh, scholars from the humanities might react to the proposals, the hypotheses, the the plans that are sketched out in supposedly scientific terms for politicians to lift and use. And I, I, I wonder whether you think it's as easy as picking up some piece of the scientific uh, evidence and then arriving at decisions, Supadra. Uh, well, I guess if I thought it was that straightforward, I probably wouldn't be here. And um, for me, watching this unfold as a historian of science, a historian of eugenics, of race science, um, it was impossible to hear talk of ideas to do with herd immunity, which were disavowed almost as quickly as they were picked up, um, and not think that's eugenics. Um, and it was, uh, th this is something that is concerning because of course, as has already been spoken about, it's really difficult to do this in the absence of the politics. Um, and what was very much the case, as far as the government is concerned, is that you have senior people, if not in the government itself, but certainly very close to the government, who have avowed eugenic positions. They believe that it is possible to pick and choose, to decide um, in society, in the case of the pandemic, really, who gets to live and who gets to die, which is the fundamental premise of eugenics, 
Um, but more widely, in terms of other kinds of legislations, they are the ones who are legislating for who gets to survive and who gets to thrive. So the idea of herd immunity was, and I completely agreed with this aspect of it, which is that you protect the vulnerable, you protect the elderly and those who are um, at greater risk uh, of dying from this disease. Although the point was to, they were supposed to self-isolate in the absence of any kind of meaningful infrastructure. So for, again, for disabled people to self-isolate is a very difficult thing if you can't be guaranteed um, that you're gonna be able to support that way of living. Um, but what, what started to become very clear in the way that this was working um, was that black and brown people, as is the case with the prison population in this country, um, were overrepresented in the number of people who were dying from this disease. Um, and again, as a, looking again to the idea of the history of genetics and where ideas to do with physiognomy, race and eugenics come from, immediately the first question was, is there something genetic about black and brown people that make them more susceptible to this disease? Now, I'm not a geneticist, I'm perfectly open to the idea that there might be something genetic. But equally, the fact that it wasn't even considered or wasn't given the same amount of weight that the fact that black and brown people, again, they're overrepresented in that term, key workers. They are the people who are working on the front line of the NHS as emergency workers, doctors, nurses. They're at the front line of supermarkets. Um, they're, at the, they're the people driving buses and keeping the transport infrastructure going. The fact that, to me, the very simple fact that these people are overexposed or at greater risk of exposure to the disease, um, and therefore that's the reason they're dying in greater numbers. The fact that we would think that there was a genetic reason for it seems to me to be to go way, way, way around the houses. Um, and again, this is possibly not surprising given eugenicists sitting at the very, well, sitting at the right hand whispering as he was into the ear of government. Um, so for me, the, the fact that the public solidarity was comprised by Dominic Cummings breaking lockdown rules wasn't the shock to me. The thing that was scary was that no one was paying any attention to what he was saying the government should be doing about who we value in society. Um, and I think the onus then is on everyone to be more scientific because this aspects of this work has already been done. Um, Dr. Winston Morgan has spoken um, at length and ex in extraordinary detail with a huge amount of passion um, about why it is that black people might be suffering from this disease in different kinds of ways. There's a theorist um, in the States, I'm about to lose her name, Arlene Gerodimus, who's spoken about the topic of weathering, which is the idea that being discriminated against in the society is actually bad for your health, and that might feed into the loop. So, it, it kind of reminded me of, um, I studied archaeology at university, and when I met the man who would become my father-in-law in my first year, um, and uh, his son was doing chemistry at the time, one of the first things that he said to me over dinner was, you're in a hot air balloon with a physicist, a chemist, and an archaeologist, and the balloon is going down. Which one are you going to throw out first? And as an archaeologist, my response is, why are you interested in killing people before trying to fix the problem? <laughs> nice, thank you. I, Philippe, I wondered if this echoed with you whether some of the discussion that was going on, the bandying about of decisions about what to do with various populations, whether that alarmed you, whether as a lawyer you felt uh, a need to respond. I, I want to ask you that and then I want to bring Anthony back in on how Independent Sage were responding to the same set of discussions. Well, th th thank you, Barry. I mean, it was a point that I was going to come on to later, but I think one of the things that's been striking to anyone who's involved in regulatory design is the way they've gone about looking at the setting of the rules with questions um, really following on from what Subhadra has said about whether they are taking into account the unintended consequences of certain regulatory choices that are being made. I mean, I'm not sure how much lawyers are good for, but one of the things th that we are often required to do is to identify particular options for achieving an objective that has been set for us by others 
who are not in the humanities. You want to achieve X or Y objective. What are the different techniques that are available to you for doing that? What are the carrots? What are the sticks? Do you use economic incentives? Do you use punishment? Do you use the criminal law? Do you use the civil law? And just listening to Subhadra, I'm just re reminded that particularly now we're nine months on. What strikes me is the extraordinary confusion, state of confusion we are all in about what we are supposed to be doing. I mean, the community that I live in in London tomorrow is about to go into tier three, we're told. And yet in four days after that, we're going to go into some sort of free for all and we've just come out of something else. And the one thing that you know when you're designing rules is having determined what your objective is, you've got to keep them as simple and as clear as possible. And it's been really interesting to compare. I've divided half my time over this period between France and the United Kingdom. Okay, and people in France, frankly, bellyache as much as people in the UK about the inadequacies of the government. But it's really interesting comparing the two sets of approaches. There is real clarity in France. You know exactly what you have to do for right or for wrong. I am now in a state of complete confusion. And because I'm in a state of com com complete confusion, I, and I know I'm not alone in this, I'm going about setting my own rules yeah. for what's a reasonable thing to do yeah. in these circumstances. To be really frank, I'm pretty much ignoring now what I'm told to do because the rules just seem to me to be completely stupid and inconsistent and hopeless in certain circumstances. I'm taking incredible cautions because we have people in our family who are in, immunosuppressed and who need to be absolutely protected. And so I'm not going to go and, you know, sit in a pub with my mum when I could sit across the room for five metres across in an open window and do that. So for me, the reaction is, and I'm not, I'm not responding really to Supadra's specific point, it's that something has gone wrong on regulatory design. Keep it simple is the absolutely golden rule. And related to that, it's why we trust judges more than politicians. Put the announcement of what we are supposed to be doing in the hands of people who are not politicians. I know they say that also about the science. Take it out of the hands of the politicians and give it to the scientists and don't have the politicians standing next to the scientists whispering in their ear telling them what they can and cannot say. And they should have done the same thing with the regulatory designs and with the rules. Put it in the hand, put, find a few retired judges who we really in a sense, recognised to be independent, not pushing, not looking for re-election, not doing this, to explain what the rules are, how they're going to work, what the consequences will be uh, if you don't follow them. And I think you, you will get a, a, a lot more clarity. So it, it's the delivery mechanisms, as much as the design of the mechanisms, that is causing, in the community that I hang around with, just absolute confusion about what is going on. That's that's very helpful and I think we, we it's an important point to keep that regulatory issue in mind very sort of at the forefront of our mind. When we think of the judges though we might not be thinking of Lord Sumption for that task not necessarily but um, Anthony I want to I want to come to 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 you and I I, I want to take up um, to Padra and, and Philippe's comments. One is the political sensitivity of any of the issues that came up and how much they were discussed by your group on Independence Age. And then the second thing is, if we if we do take the, the stance of saying, let's keep politicians out of it, let's, let's just let it be run by the epidemiologists, we seem to end up in the position that Sweden's in. Sweden has done that, there's a, there's a standing back by government, there's a standing back by the royal family. They haven't come out to speak. They've said, well, you know, we need the experts to do it hasn't necessarily gone terrifically well. So I, I wanted you just to reflect on both of those things, if you would. Gosh, um, yeah. So first, a, a whole number of issues you've touched on about race, about class, about vulnerability. Um, Sir David King, uh, oh, and political influence. So Sir David King first got really worried 
when he learned, you know, he was a former chief government scientist and he learned that Dominic Cummings and a couple of his psychics were sitting in on independent sage meetings. And he said, this is beyond the pale because you have to be independent and you have to be able to give, you know, straight talking. And he talked a lot about what he did with Blair and Brown and the like. And uh, so th when we got going and we, I was massively concerned about the lack of a public health voice, an independent public health voice. There were people from Public Health England, but it didn't seem that they were following what WHO had said from day one, which is very basic. It's find the virus, test, find, trace the contacts and isolate them. And then on top of that, you do social distancing and hand washing and all the rest of it. And, and then in desperate circumstances, you do lockdowns. But the, the, what you really want to do is lock the basics of public health is lock down the infection and the contacts and then you break the transmission. Now, that's what China had done. I mean, there was a report uh, published on February the 24th, which showed how within a month they really got on top of this uh, through a mixture of, you know, lockdowns in Wuhan and Hubei, but also devolution of power to the other states, massive um, education campaigns, massive uh, uh, tracing. They brought 9,000 tracers within two weeks into Wuhan to cover 11 million. Mm. When we discovered in February how much we, you know, tackled to contact tracing, it was 270 people for 55 million. Yeah. I mean, we just didn't really mobilize or and it wasn't even thought through about that we didn't try to scale up testing even though it was clear from Korea that had two outbreaks rather like we had London and the West Midlands they had two provinces they went in bang and tested as much as possible they were only doing 20,000 a day at the peak but they managed to lock it down and then they got it under control and if you look right now at China and you know China and South Korea have death rates of three per million and nine per million, I think it is now for South Korea. They've had a little spurt. We're at 950 per million. We're worse than America. So, you know, it was possible to suppress this. Gabriel Scali, who's on Indy Sage, says, you know, we, we're an island. We could have controlled our borders better. And uh, that would have required lawyers to be on board to talk about all of those aspects of rights and... But, you know, the other key thing WHO always said, act fast. Don't wait for, you know, modelers are important, but you bring the team together, you've got to move fast. And we'd had a pandemic plan, we'd had this exercise sickness, but it was soporific, our movement. And, you know, in, I, I mean, I remember pulling my hair out when the budget was on, on March the 11th, and they'd already reported that Nadine Doris, who was the junior minister of being infected uh, I think nine days earlier. Yeah. So sticking everyone into Parliament was, I mean, where was the public health person saying this can't happen? And of course, we almost wiped out our, our entire high command. So uh, anyway, back to on the, uh, what did Indy Sage say? Well, on the black issue, we were very keen to have proper representation. We have Zubeda Hack from the Running League Trust, Kamlesh Kunti, who's a GP professor, who's done some great work on this. Uh, Dean and Pile and uh, you know and we 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 really and and you know um uh Sub Subhadra is absolutely right that this is not about genetics um it's about exposure and it's about class and it's about being in the front line and doing the jobs that other people don't want to do very often and even amongst the middle class doctors they had higher rates uh because they were in the unfashionable hospitals doing a lot of the really nasty stuff without adequate PPE and the like. But then finally, on the, I'll just I'll stop in a bit about herd immunity. Yeah. Look, herd immunity is what you get from a vaccine. And it's very interesting because some viruses like measles, which are incredibly infectious, you need 95% coverage to really get control of the virus. For flu, it's going to be much less. Smallpox was eradicated because it was much less infectious, you know. Um, 
But herd immunity is also interesting because it is inter it does interact, and Carl will talk very knowledgeably about this. But it's not a strategy. I mean, name me a virus where you just let it rip. You don't, unless it's trivial, you know. And so, the and and they all backtracked about a week later. They said, "Oh no, it was never a strategy." But it clearly was. They said, well, we're going to have 400,000 people die. And that was when the Sky interviewer, you know, Beth Rigby asked um, Chris Whitty, you know, he said, well, look, hang on, 60% people get it, 1% mortality rate, that's 400,000 people. And he said, well, yeah, but, you know, and one of the modelers had said, yeah, we need a really good epidemic, as though it was some kind of, you know, epidemiological war game. And pandemics have always killed more than wartime. I mean, we've lost more people than during the Blitz. So we, you know, we should treat it very with great urgency and act fast. I'll stop. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, before I come to Joe, I want to, to get <laughs> thoughts and reflections on this. I want to encourage people to put questions in the, uh, the Q&A button. If you go to the bottom of your screens and find the Q&A, please do put questions in. We'll still have time to, to get them out. Joe, I want to, I want to um, raise the issue that's coming out here and that Anthony and, and Philippe have both raised. And that is, you know, that scientists from however wide or small a range of uh, expertise, they come together, they discuss, and then the politicians have to make decisions. And I'm very interested in that join and who polices that join. And in fact, how we think about how that should work. Because it seems to me there's a, there's a, a sort of mythical view that either we follow the signs, the science tells us we are just taking it on, or else the other view, which is the politicians that are in there all the time putting pressure on the scientists to say, come up with the, the range of options that we can tolerate. So how are, we to, how are we to think about that join and whose job is it to look at that join? Well, um, I, I think this is a question that's debated even by the people in you know, making those decisions. Because I, I can remember being um, involved in a committee of chief economists who were looking at the value of life and um, the value of health and trying to come up with a joint recommendation. And definitely some of them thought they were telling politicians what to do. And others thought, no, they were putting the options on the table because they were the technicians. And the, it was only the politicians who had the democratic mandate that the, it would be somehow authoritarian for the scientists and civil servants to be instructing outside the political process. So there's certainly a view that politicians need to be there. Um, why do they need to be there? Well, this view, I think a rather naive view, was that in a democracy, only the politicians have the legitimacy to make the decision. And that can't be completely right because they can delegate some of them to experts. But I definitely think that um, there's room for people who are not coming just from one discipline to make the decision um, because you, you could be captive by your own discipline. So if you're an economist, you're going to be looking at one type of issue. If you're a lawyer, you're going to be looking at another type of issue. If you're an epidemiologist, you're going to be looking at another type of issue. Everything in public policy is a matter of balance. So we need people who respect the science, um, but don't feel that they're dictated by it. And I think this is really difficult because one thing I've seen in uh, around people who are trying to make an honest contribution, very often people have already have their view about what is required and they look for scientific support for it. And you can find it because you can pretty much find a scientist saying more or less whatever you, you want. And so you can go around, you, you, know, you can find one study that supports the view you have. And so you can get that, you know, wave it around and say, look, here's my scientist who's, who supports my position. And I think we've seen in the last few days, the government has been guilty of this, that it went around and found the right scientists. And you know, this is called confirmation bias. And it's probably the um, thing that we fall into, we all fall into it, all the time. Um, many of us try to guard against it by reading people we disagree with or reading a variety of things.
but pretty much everyone will be looking for evidence to support their view rather than looking at all the evidence and seeing what is the conclusion to draw on the balance of all of the evidence. And this is true for politicians as much as anyone else. But, so I think the what we need I mean, is, um, well, if we had Aristotle here, he would say it's about having people with the right character, not necessarily the right knowledge. So we, so we need pe you know, people we can trust rather than people who have learned the right things. And you know, we see this you know, quite interestingly in the contrast between our prime minister and the situation in Germany. So there in, in Germany, you know, Merkel goes on television and she explains things in a way that is simple enough for ordinary people to understand, but also seem to have a scientific credibility to them. You know, whether or not she's right, she, she, she conveys that, that message that she's listened to the scientists. She's in a position to understand She's not only listening to the scientists, she's listening to other things too and, and coming to a rounded view on the basis of everything. So I, yeah, so I would say it's a matter of the character. And um, last thing I'll say, I, I was asked to write about um, the pandemic as early as April. And at that time, you know, some countries were doing well and others were doing badly. So Israel was doing very well at that time. And then a bit later on, things went wrong for them. And, and I said that it's far too early to tell um, which countries are going to be the most successful, but it's not too early to tell which countries have got trustworthy leaders. And um, we know how different countries have done in that respect. I, I think we're going to come back to the question of confidence in government and trust in government, which is hugely important uh, all around the world, as, as you say. I, 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 but yes, the issue of character. So, you know, Aristotle said, don't ask a a mathematician for a poem and don't ask a poet for a proof and that seems good advice so we've got people with different uh, ranges of, of expertise and different ways of thinking as as Lindsay talked about but I'm wondering how you then put them together I mean either you've got an independent another independent uh, sage-like body which has got all the humanities folk commenting and whether or not that would have any impact on the main decision making but if you bring humanities scholars, lawyers, philosophers, literary scholars and so on into the discussion, they work at such different time scales. And, and I'm wondering how you do the gearing so that they can actually engage and so that there is benefit of one talking to the other. So any thoughts about that, Joe? Because I, I, think, I think that gearing and the different time scales causes a really difficult problem. So I think the different time scales is, is one type of difference. Um, the, so I've been on a number of committees, uh, cross-disciplinary committees. I've, I've been involved in a number of policy areas in, in different ways. One thing that quite often happens is that governments like or departments like to ask economists because economists give you, a, give you an answer. They give you a recommendation. If you go to an economist, you're going to be told what to do, roughly speaking. Um, and then you, you, you see some of the reports that come out, some of the recommendations, and they seem rather narrow or, or wooden. So humanities scholars, social scientists quite often criticize. And I've seen a, a couple of cases where the people commissioning a report have said, actually, these are good criticisms. Let's get the anthropologists in. Let's get the sociologists in. Let's get the historians in. And of course, first thing, they don't deliver to deadline. So they, you know, they're, they're asked to do their, their report and it goes on and on. It's far too long. And the conclusions are always the same which is, this is far more complicated than people in other disciplines think. We don't have enough knowledge, we need more money for research, right? And so if you've got that attitude, um, the government is going to be maybe interested, but they're not going to turn to you in a crisis or an emergency. So we need people who are prepared to put their discipline to one side to some degree and listen to others. I mean, you and I have been on enough committees, academic committees where you hear an academic saying, well, it's not really important, but I do have an objection to that. And you know, if you had a business person doing that, you say, get out of the room. I, you know, I don't have time for that. But, but um, for academics, our, our trade in stock is the counter example in finding a problem. And if something is not 100% correct, it's wrong. Whereas in public life, if you've got something that's about 65% right, you're doing pretty well. So it's always easy to point out counter examples and problems. So we need 
people who are prepared to bring something, but also not insist that they're the only person who can be right and, and to compromise and work with others and also speak other people's language, which is quite hard. So, so we you know that idea of translating across disciplines. And actually quite often it's the humanitarian humanity scholars who can do this. We're, we're what, used to listening to different types of discourse and you know, catch on quickly and can understand one person's discourse and explain it to another. So I think you know, we can be there as a moderating factor. Uh, you know, we can bring things together, we can bring in values, we can bring in history, which is important. Even if we're not going to do what they did in 1602, it can be quite useful to know what happened in 1602. So we can have these narratives and comparisons, try to bring things together. But you know, the, there's no formula for any of this. You, you know, you have people in a room and if you're lucky, a consensus emerges. But if, it could, at the same time, it, it, all of us know, con consensus can emerge and we will go away and we say, well, that's not what I would have done. And so we can have a group think consensus as well, where, where people are just doing something to get, get it settled rather than think that it's right. So there are no secrets here, but people have to put their ego to one side. They have to put their discipline to one side. They have to respect others and be prepared to make a compromise. Yeah, I think I think those are good lessons and, and difficult to apply sometimes. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded that, you know, when humanities colleagues always say, well, we, we do things differently. You often hear the medics say, well, we know you do things differently. Can you just tell us what it is you do? And can you, you give us a definite answer? Um, and a and worry is coming back with, as, as my colleague Chris Frith and a colleague of Carl's, Chris Frith says, you mustn't just come back and say, well, it's all very, very difficult. You know, there's got to be something more than that. And, and I'm wondering if we can bring in Carl, who's been very patient here, whether um, these questions that stand back or say, you know, let's think about this or let's introduce some distinctions you haven't thought of or let, let's question some of the fundamental assumptions. Would they be of use to you? Can you stream them in as you're doing the things that you're required to do with urgency on Sage? Yes, yeah, practically, uh, um, just a technical answer to that question. The big challenge behind the kind of modeling which is um, underwrites a lot of our recommendations and forecasting is nothing to do with epidemiology. It's all about interpersonal, intercommunity fluxes, behavioral responses, it's 99% the way that we as human beings respond to the virus being, being in the population. So, you know, that's, a, I think, a really pragmatic example of the importance of a more eclectic view of the system at large of which we are part and our behavior, defining the dynamics of that system to make any sensible comments about what will happen. For example, vaccination, you know, vaccination with a compliant, informed population is completely different as a ball game from vaccinating a herd of cows. Uh, but more generally, just to, to address your question, it, 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 there is a position in terms of leveraging and getting the kind of insights and more eclectic perspective on the problems um, from the humanities that the way that you, the path to impact is not through government. And in fact, the path to impact is to do exactly what you are doing now. And I think the independent stage is a good example of that. I, I personally, and I think a lot of people would, you know, would agree with me that the impact of independent sage has been absolutely zero. And I know this to be true from the point of SBIM. I have a letter from number 10 explaining why they don't want to, ex to extend the modeling um, um, uh, group. But more generally, we've had an absolutely no impact on government decisions uh, at all. But we've had enormous impact in terms of a public understanding and enabling and informing and also providing moral support for other invested people, stakeholders, other areas of expertise. And I would submit that that's the way you make a difference, not by worrying about influencing number 10. I can tell you some horror stories about what's going on at the moment. I mean, all the issues in terms of the decision making um, uh, are really current. They're not resolved. You know, I, I know the kind of trade-offs that people are trying to use at the moment to balance the quality of their life against the, um, the, uh, the economic cost in terms of quality adjusted life years. I've seen the Excel spreadsheets. They are currently being discussed now to decide you know, whether we go from level two to level three by a handful of people. And they don't come from academia. 
they come from the people who the government listen to, which is the rebellious Conservative uh, Party members, and particularly the COVID recovery group. These are the people in charge of making governmental um, decisions. So you're not going to impact that. And I would submit that not very important, because what is important is the way that we as a population understand what's going down. And 99% is basically Philippe's um, doing the right, sensible thing in an informed way, in a compassionate, sensible way, by listening to the people he trusts. It's got nothing to do with what the government. And if that's right, it's more important to have these sessions day after day after day, bringing in all the points that you are making. I think that's probably going to have much more impact than sort of uh, worrying about an interface between SAGE and, 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 and the Cabinet Office, to be quite honest. Good. I see, I see Lindsay's in agreement. I want to bring Lindsay and then Subhadra in on that, because I'm wondering whether or not you're both as contented with, with getting the public on side, but leaving Sage untouched in this way. I mean, I think you're, I think you're right, Carl, that there's, there's very little impact, but going inside that room doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be listened to or heard if it's not going in the direction that the, the majority of people in there want it to go. But, but Lindsay, Lindsay and then Subhadra. Yeah, I just, uh, Carl, that well, you, you, that was exactly what I, uh, my, my fear and feeling is. I mean, two things to pull out from what you said. The first was the current discussions on qualities and quality of life is truly chilling. Um, and in some ways, I wouldn't, want, I wouldn't want to get into a room and be involved in those discussions as a, as a humanities scholar or, or indeed as a humanist. Um, but I think you're also absolutely right, is where, we need, where, where the humanities and the arts need to target, maybe government can create more space for this, or we can start lobbying for more space of this, is in public life, in, 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 in the lives we are living. And that's where things are so crucial, like care, like respect for life, um, like intimacy. And that's where I think the humanities are really already making a difference. I think it's also really telling that if you look at you know, research after research, it doesn't work for the States, but it works um, for the UK. If you ask people, and this is research that's being done at King's at the moment, the you know, money or your life question, which you value more, the economy or life, it's fairly much, you know, it doesn't follow on leave remain lines. It doesn't really follow on party lines. There's a bit of variation in age. The only people who seem more willing to give up um, lives for money tend to be the very rich and the better educated. So the, it is, there's not a politics of this in the way that's being made out. There is something that's been worked out on the ground about a common humanity that the humanities can, can work with and respond to. And those questions are not just around governance and politics, they're also existential. I mean, the, the bit of research that was done recently, again, the same team at King's, saying that trust in government has gone down since news of the vaccine. And, you know, me with my kind of philosophy head on thinks, well, that's existential. That's saying because we don't need to rely on you anymore because there's something else. And, yeah. and not only, and you know, as Philippe said, you know, the disastrous chaos, thoughtless chaos of our government uh, would be another reason. But that seemed to me there is something that we're missing here where we've got the social and the behavioral and science and we've got policy and governance. And there's this bit in the middle where most of us live which is how we're engaging with one another, with decision-making, with care, with shared mourning, with collective responsibility. And I would, I, you know, I, you know, my answer to the, you know, do you need more humanities? Yes, but we need more humanities education so we can take that into the world and make it more forceful. And... Thank you. Subhadra. Yeah, I thought, um, because I've, I've been thinking about what I was going to say here and, and considering this question and what I was going to contribute. And I thought, the thing that I came up with has surprised me, but I also thought it was going to be controversial in a way that it clearly isn't, um, which is that I don't think I want my expertise to be available to this government in particular, but generally any government, because, well, particularly given how, how venal and base this particular government is, I feel like if we give them greater information about how to be more efficient eugenicists, we're not necessarily helping ourselves. Um, but yeah, the, uh, I, uh, yeah, the collective, the collective power, our common humanity, um, the number of people that I know who have been volunteering in food banks or have been, you know, just making sure that their neighbours or the, um, and, and people who haven't got, who have to stay at home uh, were, were getting groceries and making those efforts within the community. Solidarity in our society is the thing that is going to be causing the shift because um, 
yeah, it turns out that we don't really elect the politicians that we need or that we deserve. Um, we're going to have to do these things for ourselves. Um, and we also know that politicians, even if presented with accurate scientific research and information, don't necessarily act on it. Just go and ask David Nutt. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's not really about them at the end of the day. There are more of us than there are of them. Um, it's down to us to be there for each other. And yeah, if the thing that people found surprising at the beginning of this was just how much solidarity there was in the community, then hopefully there is cause for hope there. Thank you. I want to uh, bring in a question now. Uh, Emma Obermeyer is asking in the chat, and I, I think I'll direct this to you, Philippe, whether there's any role for public decision-making involving the public in having these decisions. I mean, we're, we're trying to think of which range of experts would we like and who would we like to reply to them, but, but what about public involvement? I mean, public involvement can operate in a number of different ways. Um, one um, first and simple way is the question of whether you want the public to be able to observe the process of deliberation without actually being involved in it. Um, I mean, it is one thing to make minutes or redacted minutes of SAGE available long after the event. It's quite another thing to say, actually, let's just put this on Zoom. Let's, everyone can watch what the debates are and listen to what the debates are. And there would be different concerns about that. What one, one would be that people would then behave differently. I mean, we get this issue in whether to make legal proceedings open to the public or not. Um, and there is an argument that by making it widely available, in other words, not just allowing 20 members of the public into the room, which would be one way of doing it, another way of doing it is just broadcasting it on the web. It causes people to behave differently. That's not necessarily a bad thing. So that's one option. Another option is, of course, you know, going to the other end of the extreme, having the public vote uh, on decisions to be taken. Uh, having them to vote in the tiniest of communities, that's to say their own family, a village, a town, a borough of Camden, a borough of London. Um, you, you can imagine all sorts of different ways um, of, of, of dealing with this. I mean, there are pr practicalities, but, but I think one of the things that has not worked is we've understood that there appears to be a relationship between the degree of transparency in decision making and people's acceptance of the output of that process and so I, I'm not sure I'd go to the um, extreme of having uh, all members of the public i.e. the whole of the United Kingdom or England or Wales or Northern Ireland or a particular town or region voting on do we want to be tier one tier two tier three because you can imagine the pandemonium we have a, a system of sort of delegated government making but I would be really interested in seeing what goes on in the room. Yeah. Who's speaking? Um, frankly, I just switched off watching the um, presentations very early on because I formed the impression that they were not authentic. Um, and they were not authentic because no one was taking responsibility for mistakes that have been made. Uh, and no one was saying we've made mistakes. Uh, I don't know whether that's an Anglo-Saxon system, but it, it's really interesting to compare Germany and France, where the politicians say, actually, yeah, we got it wrong. We, we thought we would have this consequence if we did X, Y, or Z, but we didn't realize it would also have consequences A, B, and C, and we take responsibility, blame us. I don't think a single, I don't think a, I mean, I literally can't bear to listen to them because they don't take responsibility. And frankly, the same is true of the scientists. There's one of the scientists in particular, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say it, Mr. Valens, I simply don't trust him. He comes from a corporate background. My mates in the scientific community basically say he was a second rate bloke in the corporation that he worked for. And they basically pushed him out you know, to pasture because he wasn't up to it. And I'm looking, you know, I watch him and you sort of begin to get a sense of who 
is plausible and who's not plausible. And then having a politician parked right next to them, sort of keeping a very close eye on what they do and do not say is, I think, very compromising. So I think the furthest that I would go in terms of public input, and I think it would be very significant, is to make the decision-making transparent. Yeah, that, that seems, that seems uh, worth doing. I, and I'm very glad to, that you are a lawyer when you're saying these things in public about <laughs> Patrick Mallins. And <laughs> it, it, I, I agree with you. I think many people did switch off. They felt the inauthenticity and the stage management was too much. And yet it was important to notice that. And it was important that people could see when they were not uh, having a, a satisfactory answer. And I think it was also important that they could judge the, the, the lack of responsibility taken. And, and a, a few of us have seen little glimmers of, of Spine and Chris Whitty in not necessarily taking everything that the politicians and, and Sir Patrick Mellon say. So these, these, these things are important. Being in the room to watch cameras in there would be extraordinary. But I, I, I want to rate, uh, offer another question from the audience, and this I think goes to you, Anthony. So Adrian Simon asks, do you not think part of the reason for the success of China's efforts to suppress the pandemic was that they could control people more readily? And it wasn't about trust in government, it was just sheer ability to control people's behavior. Yeah, I actually typed something back to that. Um, <laughs> It's certainly true that China is a more um, controlling and, you know, in part repressive society. The, you know, we about the Uyghurs and all the rest of it. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, having said that, um, they did, you know, so they locked down Wuhan and Hubei pretty ruthlessly. But I say ruthlessly, they, they brought in enough people to ensure, but they also protected all their population financially. Everyone was told that their bills would be paid. They were allowed out to go to food uh, or, or in the other states. Let's, let's start with the other states. Devolved power, they were told what they had to do. They had 24 hour uh, TV channels talking about the data, the issues, what they all needed to do. They all had their bills paid. Uh, including TV and their rentals and all the rest of it. They provided food and pharmaceuticals for everyone. So there was a collective will. And, and most people, when the WHO went round, and we could get onto WHO, but we mustn't actually, um, WHO has had, in my view, a pretty good pandemic. I mean, um, and they, they only were allowed into China on February the 16th. So that's... Uh, to more than two months after the first case, and, and they should have been allowed in straight away. But in their report, they lay out that actually what China did was remarkable once they got their act together. They didn't say, well, you were completely hiding everything for about a month, uh, which they can't because they're a member state organization. They don't do that. I mean, that's UN diplomacy, I'm afraid. but. But having said that, a lot of the things that China did from a public health point of view, I personally believe were not impossible in our society. What, you know, I, early on we said, if you want to isolate people, firstly, you've got to financially support them. We still don't. We give people about seven quid an hour or something uh, in order to go and isolate for 14 days. Five million people in the gig economy. Yeah. And they, they just can't do it. So they lie about it. I mean, they're doing mass testing in Liverpool and only 4% of the really poor communities are taking a test. Why? Because they don't want to isolate. They can't, they can't afford it. I, I, I'm wondering whether, uh, especially when you start to think about how communities are differentially affected with the tier one, tier two, tier three uh, divisions and, uh, and Philippe warned us about too much uh, fragmentation and, and uh, uh, fractionation going down to the borough of Camden for a decision. But I wonder, Anthony, if you are in favor of something which one of your colleagues, David Price, has advocated, and that's having more chief scientific advisors for regions. If you actually had a chief scientific advisor for, you know, for Manchester or Greater Manchester, if you had, you had this in the way that the devolved nations do, there might be a way of at least contesting or 
trying to press a little harder on what information is coming out of Sage. Would that would that be a good idea? Do you think? Um, certainly. Well, look, public health is about the social determinants of health, the economics of health. It's about rights. It's about ethnicity. It's about the environment, and it involves sciences, social sciences, medicine, and of course, humanities. Hmm. And therefore, having people that reflect that, advising the politicians locally, and having a devolved system of administration is extremely important. My only qualification is, one of the problems that's happened in the UK in the last 10 years is they came and they said, we have to have government scientific advisors. So they all got appointed to each ministry and a load of them sat on stage. But of course, they're then government employees. And if you're sitting there and Patrick Valance is your boss and or Witty is your boss and Dominic Cummings is sitting there, you're not independent. When the day I arrived in WHO, I was told you're not independent anymore. Your job is to convene meetings. You can chip in. But basically, we listen to the independent sage advice. But if your boss is Andy Burnham, would that be a would that be an advantage? Well, I think I mean I think Andy would be a bit better. Um, I like the idea of people being brought in and um, doing it sort of um, on a gratuitous basis. You know that they they they're not paid employees because once you do that. I think it silences people. You know, you, you could have chosen almost anyone from the public health community to sit on that stage and they would have contested at the very first meeting the idea that you don't test and that you don't set up a different kind of tracing system. I, I haven't met a public health person that wouldn't have said that. OK, I've, I've got uh, limited time. We're going to have to wave goodbye to, to Carl, who thank you very much for joining us, Carl Friston. Uh, you have to be elsewhere, I know, but, but thank you. Still on Zoom. <laughs> Joe, could could I just raise a question with you, and then we'll have a last question, which we may have to do in a in a quicker way than than I'd hope. But um, James Wilson asks, should we have a chief humanities advisor? <laughs> uh, what a well, I'm sure there are some people who would apply for that job. I'm I I don't think it's one I would want myself. Um, I mean, even the idea of a chief scientific advisor is rather strange. If you think about all the sub disciplines of science, it has to be someone who can, who knows who to call on, what expertise to call on. I'm not sure in the humanities whether expertise works in the in the same way. Um, yeah, I tend to think that. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it is fascinating. One, the, one of the first committees I was on um, was looking at the uh, scientific experiments on animals and what happened was that there were you know, 15 scientists all who'd been working on this area all their life and me as an ethicist supposedly who'd never looked at the issue at all and so I asked why do they ask for experts in science and a non-expert in ethics and they said the problem was that if you've got an expert in ethics you've already chosen the result by the choice of that person because if someone comes with an ethical view then they're not going to change it in, in the committee. So what you need is someone who can evaluate our arguments, can, can look at the evidence, can look at the best arguments. And in, in, in that circumstance, you, you need one type of person. In a different circumstance, you need someone else. So I don't know. I'd never thought of having a chief humanities officer. Maybe James or someone else might be able to persuade me of the uh, advantages, but at the moment, I'm a bit sceptical. Okay, now, I, last thing, and, and I'm afraid this has to be quick, we're coming close to the end of our, our uh, meeting and occasion uh, talking together. But the thought is, many things have been revealed. There have been changes in the esteem given to low paid workers who were essential and who we depended on. There have been revelations that uh, the, the people who've been most lonely in this period were the well, the young and not the old, that, that uh, actually sort of 14 to 22 have, have found it particularly hard. And, and also we know that uh, black and ethnic minority uh, communities have suffered more. And, and we also know that poverty has been the big issue in how unequal the uh, effect of COVID-19 has been. And I'm, I'm wondering whose job is it 
to ensure that these things are not forgotten and are taken forward, that they're kept in mind. And in, in some way, we need to keep urgency without emergency. We have to keep these, these issues live. They have to be as urgent as they've been, but without a, a pandemic to drive people and make them think about it, how will they be remembered? So I want to have a, a quick round. Maybe public inquiries are one of the ways, but I'm sure we've all felt less faith in decisions come to and, and subsequently ignored. But I'm going to have a quick round of all of you to just think about that question. I'll start with you, Philippe. Well, I mean, you've asked me to address the question of, you know, uh, an, an inquiry and, and um, where, where we might head. I mean, we're still in, in the midst uh, of uh, matters. It, it's plain, uh, I think most people you speak to from across the political spectrum, that things have not perhaps gone uh, as they should go. And so the question does arise, what is the best way to learn lessons? Um, we're told by our scientific colleagues, this is not the last such pandemic that we're going to face. Um, we need to be in a better position to understand where we are going to head. Um, sure. An inquiry is one way to do that, but you immediately reach the challenging questions. What are the terms of reference? Who is going to actually participate uh, as the um, uh, me members of the inquiry panel? Um, who picks the members? Uh, of the inquiry uh, panel. Is there much evidence that prior inquiries have uh, changed practices um, across time? Um, you know, the inquiry I was most recently most connected with is the Chilcot inquiry on Iraq. Um, we saw how incredibly long that took with an overbroad term of reference. And I think one of the lessons from that is we need to ratchet down to understand um, very precisely where, what are the issues on which the maximum amount of difference could be made by learning the lessons. Uh, uh, that's outside of my expertise as to what the answer to that question is. But it seems to me that is one area in which the humanities can provide very significant assistance. If you want bang for your buck, how do we make sure that next time this happens, we're in a better position to do it? I, I suspect that's not something in which our friends in the scientific community will be able to contribute a great deal on because it goes to the nature of decision-making processes. Yeah. And the nature of decision-making processes is something that different um, disciplines of the humanities know a little bit about and can bring something to bear on. Or it could be what could have been done differently to bring the public along with us. It could be a very narrowly focused inquiry. Again, that's one set of issues, I think, in which you know behavioral psychologists and psychoanalysts and philosophers and economists and regulatory experts and sociologists can help us in a way what actually informs human behavior to get a more decent outcome. But, but I, I think what I'm saying to you is the idea of an overarching mega inquiry that yeah. looks at the totality of what has gone wrong is not likely to be useful in a time sensitive sense. And I think the area that humanities can help is to find the bite sized chunks, oh. key critical issues oh. where bit of time limited thinking can have a significant impact on the lessons learned. I, I don't know what those are, but that's where I would start. If we were to do this again, what would be the micro issues where we could make a difference? I'm afraid I too am going to have to run okay. at 7.30, but I thank you, Barry, for your wonderful chairing and all colleagues. It's been a real privilege to listen to a range of different views. Thank you very much for being here. And, and that was a, a great contribution to take forward. So thanks again, Philippe, much, much obliged and grateful to you. Thank you. Let's go to Supadra to uh, have a re response to that. The, the things that we think uh, humanities scholars might do. I mean, I thought there's a lovely point by Philippe that, that actually humanities scholars might be very well placed to think about the issues we want to ask and we want to press. 
So I'm going to answer that by answering the previous question, which is whose job is it? And my answer to that is it's mine. Um, so I am a historian, I have ambitions of being a public historian, and so it's my responsibility to make sure that the things that I do within the academy uh, are as accessible um, in terms of language, in terms of platform, in terms of all those other things outside as well. Um, and yeah, I think we've, we've cottoned on to the, the fact that sometimes an academic approach, which is to be able to find fault or to find counterexample, is the way in which we're trained but maybe we can also be a bit more ambitious about finding solutions and also acknowledging and self-including to be able to say, well, you know what, if you didn't ask us, we still have thoughts, we're gonna be telling you them anyway. Good, I think you already are a public historian. I wouldn't worry about becoming one. <laughs> Thank you. Lindsay. Yes, I think, you know, just to echo, I mean, on, the, on the question, yes, public humanities, but I also think actually in some ways public humanities is an oxymoron. The, the clue is in the name, it's humanity. You know? And I think the very idea, a lot of what's gone wrong with um, your disciplinary thinking is actually severing that connection. So you're absolutely right on that. And I also think, you know, Philip was bang on the money there about inquiries. I mean, I've been watching the Grenfell inquiry very um, carefully for, for other reasons. And I think Grenfell and our current situation are continuous. I think there's a, there's a continuity there, which is a continuity around thoughtlessness, which is a continuity about structural inequality, which is a continuity about thinking that some lives do not matter as much as others. And the problem with having an inquiry is, you know, how are we going to name the crime? How are we going to name what we've done here, what we're doing? Um, so as, as with Philip, Philip I, I would be sort of very, very cautious about that. Um, and as I said before, I think, you know, one of the reasons we, you know, one of the things that has been exposed is our human vulnerability. And this has happened, this happens several times over history. There are points where it becomes kind of almost unbearable um, human vulnerability. And, and it is quite often the arts, the humanities that give forms, that give narratives, that tell stories about that vulnerability that enable us to um, create um, resilience, which is not a word I, I, I use lightly because I don't often like it, but a kind of cultural and political and human resilience. And that, I think, is, is the job of education, it's the job, job of local politics, and it's the job, just as you said, of, of teachers and writers. Well worth being reminded of that vulnerability in times when we're not facing something like a crisis and, and I think you're right and, and the worry is that a lot of people thought that COVID was maybe uh, the, the, the pandemic coming upon us as a time to rethink and reset and I think also there are fears that we won't reset. I think that's, that's a very live issue. So, so Anthony, how do we keep the lessons learned, the things that we need to attend to in view? Well, I think there are different time spans here. So first, I actually think I would do a technique that has been incredibly successful in medicine for maternal mortality, stillbirths and things. It's called a confidential inquiry. Mm -hmm. And I would do that for public health, particularly around SAGE and the administration of this pandemic. Because if you do it confidentially with a no blame culture, you get people to open up much more. So I, that's one thing I would think seriously about doing. Secondly, I think in the select committees did a very good job. I think the health and the science and technology committee, both chaired by conservatives, Greg Clark and Jeremy Hunt, but they did a good job and they really did hold a lot of people to account and, and didn't, you know, gave them a tough time. So that was good. I think there must be a public inquiry of some description. My fear is it will go on for four or five years and everyone will have left and it will all be, you know, but but you need it in order to really get it's better than a royal commission. And finally, I think the historian's view, I think I think, you know, what Subhadra is going to do and others and the literary view. I mean, there's going to be a huge amount come out, I think, on the lockdown and what happened. You'll see novels appearing. But finally, I just want to leave one thought. We're not through this. You know, we've got a massive economic shock coming. We've all, you know, 80% of the world's jobs have been affected by this. And 1.2 billion children have been furloughed for education. It's the biggest financial shock we've had in 300 years. And this is not going to go away. There's a real disconnect between the stock market and the economy right now. And I think we're going to have a very torrid year even if the vaccine is probably a way out 
assuming that everything goes smoothly in terms of not suppressing, but getting down to an, an endemic equilibrium, as Carl would say. Yeah. Notwithstanding Brexit. Um, <laughs> Joe, Joe, I'm going to give the final word to you. So, so your, your thoughts about... Uh, oh, okay, that's always dangerous. Um, I think, Barry, you may remember when we were young, politicians used to accuse each other of once promising a better yesterday and that we can spend a lot of time working out how we would have done the same thing better if it came up again. I think we have to do that, but more urgent is, is to work out a better tomorrow. And I think this was a point of your question that we're, we're learning lessons about uh, racial disparities in health, in vulnerability, risk exposure. What do we do about it? And I think you know, we, we, we could go back and think about the rise of the welfare state at the end of the Second World War. You know, what happened, there was a combination of factors. It wasn't one thing, but there was vision, uh, communication, leadership and public support. So that's what we need. We, we need a political movement that will ignite public support and they need the vision and communication of people from the humanities among others. So we should look forward as well as back. Thank you. And I'm glad you allude without naming to beverage, where, whose hall in the University of London Senate House we would all be in were we not under these strange conditions. So it's nice to have beverage's name uh, in front of us. I want to just remind everyone that the Open for Discussion uh, panels will go on. Uh, they will go on uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks and months, and you can find information about that from the School of Advanced Study website, and we might even post something into uh, the chat for you as well. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you who've joined and watched and listened to this discussion. Uh, keep the thoughts going. Uh, send us thoughts. Do join in further discussions that we'll try to keep alive on this topic, because uh, we, we've raised a lot of issues, but, but we've more thinking to do. But I'm particularly grateful to my panelists, to Lindsay Stonebridge, to Supadra Das, to uh, Joe Wolf, to Philippe Sands, and a brief appearance by Carl Frisson, but most especially to Anthony Costello, who uh, stepped in at the last moment and, and ably filled the role. We, you were invaluable, and we're very glad that we had you here. So thanks to all, and... Uh, that's it for this uh, open for discussion panel. Good night. <laughs>